Hello and welcome. I'm sitting here with well, Basil. We have an excellent interview tonight. We have a very dear friend of mine, Johnson Reed, and this is actually fairly serious, or at least not that serious, but he is a uh, Marine. He is a uh, retired uh, war veteran. And in his seven years in his military experience, he did three tours between Iraq and Afghanistan, 22 months of combat um, service, which uh, is pretty stout. Um, and he came back to America and uh, he has found his way into motorcycling and he's part of an incredibly cool program for veterans. Which nice. That Aaron's up. spot. Uh, our feet. dear friend Aaron Stevenson's uh, facility up in Spencer, North Carolina. Yeah. Um, Sounds great. You have got a very cool live shameless plug. Yes, the shameless plugs are aplenty. Uh, Blue Ridge Motorcycling Magazine. Epic. Like a little diamond in the rough that everybody in this region should have. Check it out. Yeah, I'm excited about that and having Michael come in here and talk about that. And it sounds like they might let us do some content and help, I don't know, do cool stuff with them. Let's start off with your born in Hickory, North right. Carolina. Uh, went up to the Marines seven years, and uh, you were a staff sergeant when you retired. Yes. And you did one tour in Iraq and three in Afghanistan. Two to Afghanistan. Two in Afghanistan, yep. one in Iraq. Yep. 22 total months of combat service time. Right? Yeah, it was somewhere around there. It was a little over 21 months, 22. First deployment was 2007 to Iraq, and my last one was 2010 to 2011. So in that, you know, it was a span of about four years. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was deployed for about 21, 22 months of it. Right. So, and your position, you were like the forward observation guy who would call in Air support and yeah, yeah. So, so my role in that in my job, I was a zero eight six one fire support man, um, which is just an enlisted forward observer. Mm -hmm. um, and the unit I was with, the we worked with foreign forces. So in Iraq, worked with the Iraqi army. Afghanistan, the first time worked with the British army. Um, that's probably my most memorable tour. And then my third deployment was with the Marine Infantry Battalion, um, and I picked up another qualification to call in. Close air support by that. So, mm -hmm. artillery, mortars, close air support, that was kind of my thing. So, really, really wild time in your life. Great time. Mm -hmm. Friends, camaraderie, excitement, and you come back to America. Yeah. And uh, your first couple of years back were not the greatest, huh? Yeah, yeah, it was It was weird. Um, whenever you're in the military, everything's so structured and, mm -hmm. and you have such a, a form. You know where you're going to be in a week. You know where you're going to be in a month what you're doing within the next year, give or take. Um, and whenever you're out, it can get pretty strange um, mm -hmm. because you don't have any of that structure or that guidance anymore. And it's, um, yeah, it can be, it can be an odd situation to find yourself in socially, uh, emotionally, mentally, you know, all these, these different aspects. But then interestingly <clears throat> enough, in the October of 2016, you found yourself over your head, <laughs> literally, yeah. at a corner speed race school That's at right. VAR with a dear friend, Uncle Aaron Stevenson. Yep. As your first experience on a track day with a couple of months most like experience. That's right. <laughs> I'd been riding for about five months at the time, and a friend of mine was coming up there to do the track day, and he said, hey, you should take this school. Um, thanks, Tim. If, uh, if you're watching this, and he said, you should take this school. It'd be cool. Uh, so yeah, first track day was a corner speed rider school, race license accredited school, um, at Virginia national raceway North course, first track day ever been Box. riding for about four or five months at the time. Box stock Ninja 650. That's right. <laughs> and, uh, as fun as it was to ride, uh, what a, it was not the platform to be out there on. Um, well, I mean, I remember doing a track day with you sometime later and coming down, I think we were at Summit Point. Summit Point. And yeah. I remember looking back over my shoulder and seeing you coming over the hell, <laughs> like wondering, <laughs> wondering what you were doing. <laughs> it's like, what's he doing on that thing? <laughs> yeah, I was probably, I was probably wondering. I mean, it was thing. stock suspension, stock tires. We have a. I'm looking this direction because we have a road racer in the room, so he's smiling in approval <laughs> at this story. But yeah, I was like, what on earth are you doing on that bike? I mean, mm -hmm. 
luckily you did transition out of that to a race prepped R6. I did, yeah, yeah. The, the 650 was nice, but it does not belong on the racetrack in its factory form, um, 100%. So a good buddy of mine, he was uh, selling his older um, R6, he has two of them, he has a 03 and 012, or 12. Well, I bought the 03 from him, and that was his old club race bike uh, back in his race days. And it's been excellent to me since. Yeah. That, you know, I enjoyed riding on the track. I enjoyed muscling that 650 around. But I really see, I saw what it was supposed to feel like on a properly set up bike like I thought it was. Well, and this is a bit of an interesting segue because the reason that you're able to go so well on the R6 is because not long after your track day, you found your way into a program called Candesteer. At Aaron Stevenson's Corner Speed Facility, mm -hmm. which is specifically for veterans. So, um, why don't you tell our viewers yep. what Candace Steer is and okay. what that experience was like for you? Okay. Um, yeah, so shortly after, let's see, that track day was 2016. Um, Counter Steer was formed. We held our first event in December of 2016. I came there as a participant. Um, and at first what we had was uh, a handful of veterans there to participate in a lightened corner spin curriculum weekend. And what we have is a, a training facility in Salisbury, North Carolina, um, also known as corner spin for the paid side. Counter steer is the not-for-profit um, 501c3 that, um, that Aaron Stevenson has formed for post-9-11 veterans to come out and have a good weekend motorcycling, um, de-stress, decompress, whatever may be on their mind and also improve their riding skills or learn riding skills if they don't even have any. So, so you came as a participant. I did. Came back a number of times as part of the program. Yes. Started doing corner spins, did more corner speeds, and that's how you graduated into riding more track days on the R6. Yep. Yeah, that was so. This was 2017. Now I attended two counter steer events in Salisbury, and shortly thereafter, um, Aaron asked me, "Hey, I have a, an assistant position available to help out at corner spin, corner speed. Uh, would you like to come on board?" And naturally, I said, "Well, yeah, I would love to." You know, the the man has a wealth of knowledge. He's a great guy, and amazing facilities. Um, so came on board and. Um, Came on as an assistant mm -hmm. uh, with corner spin, so I really got to see the full the full take of it. Also, assisted in helping out facilitate counter steer events, mm -hmm. and um, just jump jumped head first, and it's been it's been a good ride. Yeah, because I mean, I am actually a graduate of corner spin, corner mm -hmm. speed, um, and I've been with you guys kind of steer at an article for a magazine. Yep. Some not long time after. You started, so I've actually spent the weekend at the program, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. So you are still running Candice Deer? Yes. Yep. We are still uh, hosting events. Um, I don't know the total number of events that we're up to now, but we are hosting six to seven, sometimes eight events a year mm -hmm. um, uh, at the Cornerstone facility. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great time. The only... Uh, factors that we have, obviously, COVID kind of kind of hurt us a little bit there um, with uh, shutting the facility down and um, also people's travel arrangements. We've had people from Ohio, Florida, local to North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, you know, people from all over are coming. So it's, it's really good to see the participants come. We're getting the word out that we're still hosting events and and that people can come and ride with us. So I know that you have been particularly interested in the development of your motorcycle riding since meeting Aaron, mm -hmm. going through the programs. I mean, perhaps you just, you know, from a perspective of improving as a motorcycle rider, maybe you'd like to just, what are these programs? Mm -hmm. How do they help you improve? What do they do for you? So, you know, with, with it being located at, at Cornerspan and it also being uh, Aaron Stevens's program, he's, um, very renowned and revered coach, mm -hmm. educator, however you want to word it, in the motorcycle community. Um, so I've been able to, I've had an inside look with the corner spin facility, and that enables me as an instructor to also be able to, to, to preach that word and those skills and the techniques and the knowledge um, 
to our our veterans that are learning to ride or may have some experience but not formal training. Um, it enables me to be able to, to to share the knowledge that I've learned and it go to to the guys that may need it. And from a purely functional perspective, it's not that everyone's going to come to here and graduate as a road racer, but if they do want to go ride on the road, they're going to be a lot safer, have a lot more skills, and going to be able to enjoy it a lot more. 100%. Um, you know, whenever I see people riding on the street, just random people riding by, you know, you usually, as a, as a coach, instructor, anybody that has an idea of what's going on, you kind of pick apart what people are doing wrong. And you see a lot of it. Um, mm -hmm. And the thing is, you don't know what you don't know. And a lot, you know, the, the, the fact of it is that a lot of people that are riding motorcycles now don't have any formal training. Mm -hmm. They don't understand what the bikes are doing, what the physics is telling them of the bike. Um, so whenever you get out here, you have people from all different, you know, varying levels. Um, and you're able to break it down of, well, whenever you're riding and you're really hard on the brake and, and you feel the front kind of do something, what is it doing? Well, I don't know. It just kind of wobbles a little bit. Well, this is why it's wobbling a little bit. And this is how we can mitigate it. Um, so it's really good to be able to get that, that knowledge out and, um, and educate people so they are safer riders, uh, more responsible riders as well. You got a guy comes back, um, gets out of the military, he's kind of looking for his thing and goes out and buys a 600 or a thousand. My first bike, my first street bike, had no clue what I was doing. I picked up a 04, 05 ZX6R um, and rode it for about four months. Thankfully, it got stolen. Um, because I probably would have killed myself if, if I would have kept it. I had zero clue what I was doing. This was 20, this might've been 2013 or 2014, as soon as I got out of the military, because I was looking for some kind of belonging and adrenaline fix, something. I had no idea what I was doing. Mm -hmm. Thankfully it got stolen. I didn't kill myself and I decided, okay, I really like motorcycle. I'm going to get back into it the right way. And I try to, I try to spread that kind of thought to really any veteran that I meet motorcycle, say, hey, come ride with me. Mm -hmm. You know, you think that you know how to ride a motorcycle great, show me you can ride it great, and let's have a good time doing it. But if you don't and you have questions on something, let's go to a safe environment where you can ask questions mm -hmm. and I can give you an educated answer or give you to someone that will be able to answer that question if I don't know. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So from purely from the skill perspective, there's nothing to gain, well, nothing to lose from coming because you're just yep. gaining knowledge. Exactly. And then from your perspective, you know, coming back from war, coming back to find a place to fit in, it's not going to replace that camaraderie that you had with your yep. people. I mean, but it's it's a step in that direction for you now. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And it, one of the best byproducts of counter steer that, that I've seen is it, it brings guys together. And it gets them connected with people of like minds. Whether you are an avid motorcyclist or you've never been on a motorcycle before, but you have an interest. It brings you together. You can share the passion, share the memories, establish bonds, friendship. Um, there's so much more to it than just training and being efficient. It opens up a whole other social aspect of your life that you may never have known about. You know, I, I think that you won't meet friendlier people in many places besides a paddock. Just about a paddock in anywhere, track day. Mm. Everybody is there. Everybody's willing to help. You have nothing to lose. Absolutely nothing to lose by coming out. You'll have a, I guarantee you'll have a great time. It may spark a passion. And uh, if it if it doesn't, then then you know motorcycle is not for you. But if, if you think motorcycle might be for you, um, I think that you'll have a great time coming out. I got a quick technical question to ask you. You bought your corner spin canister bike with you, so just quick top to bottom, mm -hmm. what is the bike that you bought with you, mm -hmm. and the bikes that people ride for canister steer? Okay, um, so my bike DRC one twenty five L. Um, it currently has a one forty three kit, I believe it is. So you hopped up the motor. Didn't yep, you? yep. So it's but just hopped up. So you yeah, I need a little bit of extra power. You know, it was either going to be. I either need a 125 or a 150. Um, and I like the nimbleness of the 125. The 150 sit up a little bit higher, you know, CRF 150F sit up a little bit higher and they're a lot heavier. And while I can ride them, I don't really like riding them. I like the, the nimbleness of it. Um, so 
But because it is a 125, and I am a big guy, I also beefed up the suspension. It's got CR85 front end on it, uh, CR85 forks, and um, also with the disc brake up front from the CR85 kit. It's, it's real nice, really stops it. Um, and yeah, engine, exhaust, and a bridge then, suspension, and then you put a different type of tires on there so yep. you break traction more easily. Correct? Yeah, yeah. So it, it, instead of the uh, the factory wheels, it's sitting on 17s now. It adds a little bit of versatility. If I want to go ride car tracks, there's a multi, you know, multitude uh, selection of tires I can ride for a car track. Um, right now, I have a Road Race Rain and a Road Race Intermediate on it. Mm -hmm. um, they work at corner spin for traction and I can, there's enough traction there and I can spin it whenever I really want to. I can slide it when I really want to. But if I just want to get on the gas, it still grabs enough to to, to get me going. So they're pretty custom made for corners. Spin, spin, yeah. yeah. I mean, actually, they are set up for it. Right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and then the customer bikes or kind of steer bikes mm -hmm. are pretty much XR100s, yep. CRF150s. CRF 150s, uh, DRZ 125. we're out of 125s now. So we went completely red with the Hondas. We're at CRF uh, 100s, a couple older XR 100s, and CRF 150Fs. So, right. And the quick Reader's Digest version of why you're riding the smaller bikes is, is the penalty is lower, lower speed, That's right. but you're still finding the limit. We can still work on the the physics and the techniques and um, and everything at a, at a lower risk physical, you know, a lower risk of physical harm, uh, but we can still work on those techniques of, okay, what's it feel like to lock the front up? How do we slide the rear with purpose? What happens if we slide the rear without purpose? What happens if we, you know, push the front? We know we can, we can learn what that feels like because physics and feel is going to be the same, whether you're on a small CRF 100 or you're on a GSX-R1000. You know, if you lock the front tire up, you're going to feel it, and this is what it's going to feel like. We can teach that in a low-risk environment uh, at corner spin um, with with min I'm going to call it minimal minimal risk to ourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's great. So, well, thank you, Jonathan. That's a quick explanation of your bike and the bikes that you would use at Canada Steel. Yeah, thank you. So, you guys, episode nine. I'm going to share something personal with you. You know, last couple of weeks, I've been kind of jacked up. I don't know what it is. I'm uh, not sleeping so hot, and I'm not angry, but I'm not happy. I'm just kind of like all over the place. And it kind of got me thinking about vibes, you know, and like how we can feel totally different on one day, another day, whatever, right? Especially in 2020. I mean, they should be doling out Percocets, I think. Um, or whatever your drug of choice might be. Not that I'm condoning drugs, but... My point here is that I've just been trying to think about, you know, self-regulation. You know, like, what does it take to kind of feel better? Um, of course, you know, drugs and alcohol, they always help. But what is a natural way to do it, right? And so in that quest, I've been thinking about a lot about self-talk, you know? Do you ever just talk to yourself like you're an, you're an a-hole? Like, what is that about? So bullet point number one, whoosh, mute your inner Karen. You know, like, what, what is that about? So I think if we get there, then we kind of have this nice, happy medium, positive trajectory, and we can kind of project that outward upon everybody else and the things that we say and the things that we do. And then hopefully, like, you know, maybe there's this, you know, positive effect that resonates out. I think all this vibe stuff is true, man. It really is. Um, another thing I find myself doing that's maybe a bad habit is just like not staying at the moment, in the moment, you know, where it's like, oh, dude, I wish it was like five minutes from now because then I'll have like lunch or something. <laughs> And so I think we do that a lot. I think whether it's that or an upcoming vacation or some weird expectation we put on ourselves, we're never there. And so we're kind of constantly pissed at ourselves. So that's stupid. Let's stop doing that. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot to be said for the, for the DGAF thing. Like we have to, you know, calmly put down some of our Fs, I'm not trying to say the F word. You know, stop carrying like so much baggage um, about like self expectation and, and sometimes expectation of others. People are gonna mess up and it's gonna be annoying. But like, I don't know, I just think there's something to be said there for, uh, for some of that, you know, trying to stay in the moment. And I think, you know, 
there's also just kind of the aspect of gratitude. Uh, let's like screen print it and put it on a sign. But seriously, like gratitude is a big deal, man. I think it's like the last, the last like piece you have to hold on to, you know, as far as like maintaining uh, kind of where you want to keep your headspace. You know, I really do think it's true. I know a lot of people who are loaded, man, and they're just effing miserable. You know, it's not about the money. I just think it's like trying to engage in whatever moment you're in and, you know, be thankful for it, right? Like, so I'm not trying to take Tony Robbins' job or anything, but I've been thinking a lot about this stuff because a lot of this works for me. And I can tell you, you know, whenever you fall off and you go to somewhere negative, it's, it's always a downward spiral. So, you know, that's clearly not what you want. But, um, you don't have to whistle zippity doo dah out of your butthole every day either, but I think some of this stuff works and it works on a cosmic level. And I was going to get into how, you know, all of this has kind of like shown up in all these weird old patents. Maybe we're all walking capacitors. That's for another episode. Good night. What's up you guys? Basil here with Michael Gouge and Blue Ridge Motorcycling Magazine which uh, is my responsibility to showcase tonight for the Shameless Plug. Thanks for coming, Michael. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm real excited to be here on Neil Bowie Rides. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've been a fan of Neil for years, followed his stuff, and so I'm happy to be on his YouTube channel. Yeah, and I'm glad you're here, man. Uh, so Michael just rolled in today. I'm trying to get my news together. He hands me one of his magazines, and I'm immediately enthralled. I'm like, dude, this is my backyard. You know, where, where have you been this whole time? So uh, really stoked to kind of get to learn more about the magazine and the format and where you guys are going and where you've been and all that stuff. Great. Uh, we are a, uh, a quarterly travel and leisure magazine. We're sort of aimed for the upscale motorcycle traveler. We cover all types of bikes. So we cover cruisers, sport bikes, touring bikes, adventure bikes, and even vintage bikes. Uh, we love going to vintage motorcycle festivals and pro you know, profiling uh, vintage motorcycle builders and restorers. Uh, we cover a wide range of stuff. Uh, people, people always think we're the Blue Ridge Parkway magazine, uh, but the Blue Ridge Mountains are more than just the parkway. And we try to capture that in, in the magazine. We uh, cover from basically Georgia and that little corner of Alabama all the way up into West Virginia. We cover some of the best roads and hidden valleys and neat little towns and, and those great motorcycling roads that once you ride them, you really sort of feel a sense of why we ride motorcycles. You know, right. we don't ride it just for transportation. We ride it kind of to fulfill our soul. Sure. And, and how lucky we are to be in this region. Exactly. Like all these great spots to ride. You know, the Blue Ridge Mountains is one of the best motorcycling regions on the planet. And I talk to motorcyclists all the time who've been all over the world. And they always say the Blue Ridge Mountains is one of their favorites. Right? Yeah. Exactly. So, I Maybe mean, we should just cut the tape and not tell anybody so that like, nobody else comes. Yeah, no, I've gotten in trouble <laughs> because I have given away some of my favorite roads. And yeah. some of my friends have like, don't talk about that road because all the tourists will show up on it. Right. Uh, right. So, yeah, I do kind of betray we'll some like, of my have to, like, shoes, you know what I mean? Yeah. But, no, I think there's plenty of stuff out there for everybody, and um, there's there's really a lot to discover in here. So, um, the Blue Ridge Motorcycling Magazine. We cover, our motto is the best rides in the Blue Ridge region. Uh, we're not just sort of uh, go down this road, turn left at 12 miles, and go down this road. That's my job. Yeah, uh, I get I get some complaints about that actually that people kind of want that, but there are dozens of websites that detail roads in the Blue Ridge Mountains and maps and GPS coordinates. What our magazine tries to do is capture the passion for riding. It's why we love riding motorcycles and why we love the Blue Ridge Mountains and. You just don't get that on a lot of sort of websites or YouTube videos, right? And so what we try to do with this luxury print product is we want something you're going to spend time with, right? And so it's, it's, it's something that at the end of a long day, you sit down with the magazine and we try to take you on a journey. And, you know, 
that just doesn't translate in different types of mediums. Mm -hmm. And so we try to be more, almost more literary that the way we describe writing uh, is kind of an escape for you. Uh, we're not like a news publication. We don't do product reviews. We don't do bike reviews. All we do is celebrate riding motorcycles in the Blue Ridge Mountains and profile the people who love riding motorcycles in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Mm -hmm. And even just, you know, if you're into being outdoors and getting outside, you don't have to ride a motorcycle to go no. see some awesome waterfalls and stuff. So yeah, it's just, it's a really, you know, very well-crafted, um, tasteful little read. And it's nice, you know, the, the semi-lost art of print, you know, it's nice yes. being able to carry this and take this on a, on a trip somewhere and, you know. Right. And shameless no. plug, shameless plug, if the viewers of Neil Valley Rides go to Blue Ridge Motorcycling Magazine .com and enter the coupon code FALL2020, you will receive 35% off a subscription for one year. Do it. Do it, man. This is like, you know, good ideas for your next road trip, places you didn't know you want to see, but you want to see lots of good stuff in here. Support the region and uh, the local riders. And um, man, thanks for coming in and telling us about it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Good evening. I'm Nate. This is Get Off My Lawn. Tonight, I want to talk to you guys about a subject that comes up quite a bit um, in what we do, you know, we do Euro bikes, vintage and, and modern, and we do a lot of tuning and race performance over at Tutopia Cycles. Um, and the subject always comes up with, I want to put aftermarket or performance parts on my bike. Okay. I'm going to break that down. <clears throat> so when you do things and listen, I'm stepping on toes right now and I, more than anybody's I'm stepping on my own toes. All right. I like putting performance parts on my bikes as well, but let me, I don't know how to put this. If you put those on your bike, it doesn't make them worth any more money. So whatever you do, don't put performance and bling on your bike to increase its value, okay? If you buy that thing and put Rizoma crap all over it and try to sell it a month later, it's still worth less than you paid for it a month ago, okay? So what you have to be careful of is doing performance add-ons for gain. You need to learn that that stuff's for you. So if you put a pipe, have me tune your bike, and it's awesome, it's still worth the same amount as Joe blows down the street with less mileage on it, okay? Because that's not what people are looking for. That's what you're looking for. So I'm all for putting performance equipment on your machine, okay? But that needs to be for you. It needs to be a personal thing. You're trying to build this for what you want it to be and not trying to add it for added value. Because believe me, you're gonna give that shit away. Now we're you moving on to South Carolina, you'll see the whole get thing. off my lawn Q and A. I got a question. Yes. When you go for a ride, what is the thing that makes it an awesome ride? Or what are the things that, you know, kind of make it memorable? You can look oh, back and all right. well, that, that was an awesome ride. That's a good question. The question was, what makes an awesome ride or, or, or what makes a ride memorable? Well, there's a few things. One, it's how it makes you feel. Uh, we heard earlier about uh, certain areas that you go to that, I mean, it almost makes it euphoric. It's almost like a drug. When, when the temperature is right, the lighting is right, you're on a bike that is running just right, you can feel it, you know what I mean? And it's almost euphoric, it's almost like a drug. It, it, it just, uh, you know, and then you live in that moment, just like uh, Basil was talking about earlier. Uh, 
of just enjoy that moment, man. You know what I mean? Everything is right at that moment and you're free. You don't have a cage around you like a car. You don't uh, have somebody squawking at you or whatever. You know, even with a passenger, like with my wife on the back, not that she squawked at me. But uh, with her on there, and she's a very good rider. She leans when we need to lean. And, you know, and it just all feels kind of, I hate to use the word synergy because I hate corporate America. So it's all like, uh, what do they call it? What do the, the yogis or whatever call it? Like, uh, I don't know, namaste. So let's talk a little bit about distance. And what I'm talking about is how far behind a motorcyclist should I stay when I'm in traffic? All right, whatever, think of the number. I want you to think of how many feet behind this motorcycle I want to be, okay? Well, in driver's ed, you were always taught the three second rule. They pass something, you count one 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000, okay? But in reality, in your car, with a car in front of you, it's one 1,000. That may be acceptable in a car, but it's not for a motorcycle. When I see people behind me, and I mean behind me, where my mirror is filled up with their POS, I mean uh, automobile, it makes me nervous. And it should be. Because if there were some situation where they weren't paying attention, see last episode, whatever distance you think that is safe, add a few more seconds to that. That motorcyclist sees you as a threat. Because if you're not paying attention for some reason and you were to strike that motorcycle, it's pretty much instant death, okay? We're not in a cage with a trunk and a back seat and airbags and four brakes. We're just basically on a big ass bicycle. Would you tailgate a bicyclist that close? You probably would, you scumbag. So that's why we're talking about this. Back the hell on off, okay? If you are a millisecond earlier to the next red light, what does that accomplish? It accomplishes nothing. I don't know, we were talking about this earlier, about in traffic, how even in your car, watch the a-hole that's darting in and out. Okay? And then when you get four lights later, how much farther are they really ahead of you? Enough to endanger your life or anyone else's life? No. So, you know, if you're rushing home to eat your tacos, put them in the fucking microwave, man. All right? Think about the people around you. Thanks and good night. Prep, did we? No. Fuck. I was a bit worried that you'd been getting ready for this. It sounds too rehearsed if we're ready. Basil. 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 Well, the, the problem is apparently we're dull. We're we have like 200,000 subscribers in like the last week. No, that's Miley Cyrus's YouTube channel. Have you but seen she that? commented last week, so we got a foot in the door. Kidding me. I am going with Tufts. No, not that. Medicated like pads? No, with the editor of the magazine. Oh, yeah. Hello and welcome. Nine times. Nervous? Hello. Have you been on camera before? It's been a while. How do you Last feel time about? there was a black couch, walked in. <laughs> pretty good. Bought your corner speed. Yeah, I did that. Do you need any more mind altering drugs or alcohol, Basil? Well. Not the moment.
Did I fart? Did you see it? What was it? <laughs> what the hell is it? I gotta know now. Is it a giant fucking roach? Mike Pence is fly. Oh fuck! Ah! Ah! No! Ah! Money, money, money! Money, money, money! money. Ah! Roachy, my best friend. But that was the so <laughs> awesome. I brought him down from Asheville. Like... <laughs> I just don't care, man. I gotta be honest. Jesus Christ! Oh, All right. uh... We're oh, filming. Yeah, oh, we're filming, me. dude. Sorry, I didn't Look. know you guys are filming. Where's my beard? Look, it looks like you just this came out of phone. a vagina. Sorry. He was like... <sighs> Pipe. 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 What, or what was that, episode? Five? I don't know. The one where I'm... I'm going to stay, bro. Now I'm going to stay here and drink this beer, so I'll see y'all later. Thanks, <laughs>